Welcome to episode 14 of the AFA GenXt podcast. My name is Ashley Mahadia, National Chair of the GenXt Community of Practice and your host for this episode. A big thank you to the AFA for allowing us to host this podcast and to our supporting partner, Advice Intelligence, for powering this episode. The AFA recognizes advisors that sit at the very pinnacle of the profession via the AFA Advisor of the Year Award and the Female Excellence in Advice Award. In today's episode, I have the great pleasure of talking to our 2022 award winners, Felicity Cooper and Amy Baker. They speak about how they started a career in financial advice, the challenges faced along the journey, but also how they've been able to create unique advice offerings for their clients. Amy and Felicity, welcome to the AFA GenX podcast. So glad to be chatting to our award winners today. Thanks for having us. (laughs) Good. So let's get straight into it. Today, I really want to understand who you are as individuals and how you started. So, Amy, can you please tell me how you got into financial advice? It's quite a story because I never in my wildest dreams thought I would be a financial advisor. When growing up, I wanted to be a performing artist. I studied music, I studied singing and dancing and acting, and I got into NIDA and I then ended up doing I think about 12 years of trained jazz singing so I went straight into hospitality as you always do when you actually study performing arts uh really great at that and um then I took I started working in just some businesses and and got a nine-to-five job because I was getting really tired of the you know the long nights and whatnot and uh I found myself doing accounts like just bookkeeping and that sort of got my in you know started picking my interest in in money initially and also problem solving because I'd look at the spending and some of the things and I'd question what's going on um then I fell pregnant with my son and I thought I'm going to give one more crack I went back to study music for six months because I'd had a miscarriage before he came along and I just wanted to be in a really happy place I didn't so I thought my pregnancy is going to be happy because we're playing and singing and doing music and all that sort of stuff As soon as he was born, I went straight into banking. I got a job at St. George Bank in the collections team. And this is where I guess my my interest in money sort of really peaked. Every single client that came on board, which through the call center. So it was like we had to take a promise, promise to pay. um, And we had to get a certain amount per hour to kick our KPI. And um, I was absolutely terrible at it because every time I got a call, I wanted to fix the problem. I wanted to understand where, why they are, where they're at. And I, I was sort of almost counselling them and trying to explain how their financial product worked or how to budget and help them understand, okay, well, how much are you earning? So how much are your, you know, electricity? What's your, what, what are your bills? Well, this is what you got left over. So you can afford to pay this, you know, and I'd get in trouble for being on call for too long. But it was very clear at that point that where I was going to go was financial advice. And I, I pretty quickly went into study at RMIT via like you know, uh, remotely and St George basically then fast tracked my career and put me in the wealth team and uh, got me we started in insurance there um, so and then I got into I did Tribeca back in the day now it's Kaplan so it, it was a bit of a process of course I really fell in love with the industry and fell in love with advice because there's always been this internal thing to help other people and, and I love problem solving and numbers always sort of fascinated me. They tell you a story, right? And to, to be able to marry those two things up, helping people and problem solve just made so much sense to me with where I was going in my career. Felicity? Well, I also was not going to be a financial planner. I was going to be an accountant. And then in my last subject at uni, my lecturer said to me, I don't know why you're going to be an accountant. You talk too much and you've got the attention span of a goldfish. Uh, You should be, but you are good with numbers, so you should be in markets. So I actually went into stockbroking. And then after a number of years in stockbroking, just got frustrated with the fact that, A, you were judged (laughs) on things that you can't control. So you can't control markets. And yet that's all you do. And B, you're looking at one tiny thing. So you can get the investments really right, 
that if the strategy is not right behind it, then you've missed, it's like the iceberg analogy, you know, you've missed all the good stuff. So from there, I decided I wanted to be more strategic and went into planning. And that was my story. And what specifically attracted you to a career as a financial advisor? What are the aspects that you really love on a daily basis? we we'll start with you, Felicity. So for me, it's the problem solving and the com it can be quite complex. So it's the almost a decision making process of if I do this, then it will have multiple different outcomes. So it's really that deep thought of not something that's superficial and there's one thing that we can do and it's going to fix everything. It's we're going to do this and then we can do something else. And when we marry those together, that's where we get the really good outcomes for people. So that was it for me, really, the problem solving part of it and the challenge. Amy? I have to agree with that too, Felicity. I love problem solving. Um, I have to add to that, though, I really love this, the fact that we're a long-term relationship with our clients. And um, over time, this sort of process evolves. You see things change. So we can come to meet a client with, you know, where, where they're at and where they start is one place. But over the years, they evolve and so does that relationship. Um, and I've sort of developed different methods in my business to ensure that ongoing engagement. I found that a bit of a struggle with some people earlier on, which is sort of why I sort of went in down the road of the mindset coaching as well. But I really love that we can help make much like a greater difference in people's lives while we're also solving some problems. Like, um, you know, I get excited about the strategy and then I get excited when I get to share that and see people have those aha moments. Oh, wow. Oh, can I do that? Oh, so is that going to save me in, in tax? And at the same time, I'm actually making money. Wow, I didn't know that was possible. Like, I love those conversations. I love seeing people learn something new and get excited about that and get excited about their money and taking control of their financial future. That's amazing. And I'm sure you've gone through some challenges over time. I'd love to know about some of the major challenges you went through and also how you overcame those. Felicity? So the biggest challenges for me, I guess, were back in broking days. So, you know, having started in the 90s, um, firstly, it was a challenge being a female. So the broking industry particularly was a very male-dominated industry at the time. Then I think I backed that up with a good old technology boom and bust, then a GFC. So mm -hmm. I think they're probably my most challenging times. But then I think the other big challenge is just trying to find the balance. So I've had to learn over time that, we can't worry about clients' money more than they do. So, you know, how do you actually give the advice, enable them to do that, but not be the person that's up at two o'clock in the morning, you know, worrying about if a client is actually doing their part of it. So they're probably the biggest challenges for me is, and we, we spend a lot of time now on creating plans that clients can take authority and initiative with as well so that they really have the ownership of their outcomes. Amy. I love that. That is, I'm, I'm agreeing with you on that one. That's a big challenge that I've had um, and recently found myself falling back into that space of freaking out about the investment returns and things when sort of we started building our private wealth arm in the business. And so you've got these really high net worth clients. So, you know, a, a dip in the market could be a million dollar loss. And I started to take that on board, on board personally um until you know my husband's like pull yourself together like this is well, let's look at that let's look at this logically and I'm like hang on a minute this is usually me talking <laughs> so I totally get that challenge I think we we do take our role personally with our clients and we really are connected to our clients so there is that point where we've got to sort of go there's a line in the sand they've got to take control and be responsible we've been really clear with the risks and that this is a long-term game. This is not just the last 12 months. And so, you know, having those conversations. But again, it's also that piece where if we give that ownership back to the client, there's an empowerment there. We're educating them. We're helping them along the way. So I just wanted to touch on that. I haven't answered the question in regards to the challenges as much. But again, at, at, you know, being in advice, it, it's it's a big job. And part of that is really being able to manage 
people and expectations and give them back the power because it's their money, but we're actually giving them, te- teaching them how to make it work for them, you know, giving them the strategy. Um, That's the thing, isn't it? I mean, we are advisors. It's, it's not our money. So we're there to, to coach them through it, to let them make informed decisions. Amy, like you say, give them the education behind it so that they understand the different paths in front of them. I always say it's a little bit like a choose your own adventure book. That's exactly yeah. what I say. At the end, you, you've got these two decisions and here's all the information that you probably need to choose the right one or the best one for you. But ultimately, we are advisors. And we're there to give advice, not own all of the all of it, and take responsibility for all of it. That's I agree with you both that you know consumers should also take some ownership of everything. Now let's talk about the twenty third of September. I'm sure a night that both of you will remember forever. What does it mean for you to win the most prestigious AFA awards? We'll start with you, Felicity. Well, I was quite surprised because um, the guys that were other finalists are really outstanding advisors. So for me, it took me by surprise, which w- meant that then I was speechless, which doesn't happen too much. Um, but f- for me, the process of the awards is that it's a process, not just an outcome. So, you know, I was talking to somebody who said they've been through a few submissions and then it gets too hard and they don't do it. Whereas I've always looked at the whole process of a, it's a really good opportunity to sit back and be quite introspective about what's working, what's not working. And you just do your best at that. But ultimately that day of judging, it's six people's opinion on one hour. So the thing I, I really don't want to do is take away from the other two guys. Cause I just think they're awesome. Um, am I happy I won? Sure. Very excited? Yes. But those guys also deserve it. Well said. Amy? Yeah, I agree with you that um, it was a big process. And the process for me allowed me to really appreciate all the things that I've achieved and not really acknowledge much in my career until that moment. Um First, going back to what you were saying, Felicity, in terms of the, you know, your the, the other finalists, um, I was at one among six. So I look at those women and I was, you know, in awe of all of them and felt we all deserve to be there. And then that day of, you know, that judgment day <laughs> where we get our photo shoot and we have to present and we're on video and we, you know, but before that, even just writing out that whole application process has um, really been quite a, a, a an experience for me and a growth experience for me as well I had to really look back at all of the things the sacrifices the challenges um, that I've gone through to actually appreciate myself and I never do um, and and look around at the community and the support that I've actually had from a lot of peers as well that have helped me get where I am something I didn't mean, I didn't um, answer before in terms of challenges So I started my business after being promised equity in a private firm and got really frustrated that I was getting nowhere. And so out of, I guess, that fire in my belly and anger, I actually stepped out and started my own business as a single parent with not a cent to my name. And that was the hardest thing. And I had that imposter syndrome that I didn't belong as an advisor because I didn't have an office in the city. I was driving my car, parking it blocks away from seeing clients. I had to work in the local cafe and restaurant just to make ends meet but I just knew something in me kept me going you know I just knew that there was uh, I was going to make it every time I nearly uh, started to send an email to a recruitment agency I'd get a phone call or an email or an inquiry would come through that another client just turned up and so I just kept going but it was also the community and like AFA Inspire some of these amazing women like um, Deborah Kent and Sharon Hills, Jenny Pierce, they all, you know, they were there and helping me in terms of just encouraging me. You're doing a good job. You know, we know it's hard. You know, being a female as well, being the only woman in the room sometimes. But sometimes being the what, you know, you're walking around thinking we're in the world of wealth and I'm tr- struggling to kick the roof over our heads, you know. But it all paid off. Um, so when I did this award, I think it was a real point to say, if I can do this, 
anyone can do it. Like I started from nothing and it was hard work, but hey, you keep going and it's it's so worth it. And other people in the community keep you going as well. Having mentors, having, you know, having coffee with somebody, turning up to these events like, you know, Gen X and, and Inspire and, you know, finding finding a group that are going to keep you accountable is also what's get got, you know, got me to where I'm at. And why you know this award has been so important to me. Yeah, I'd like to add that your victory speech, if I can call it that, <laughs> one of the best I've, yeah I've ever heard. It was very inspiring. Now, well, you. obviously, you two are doing something amazingly well to win those awards. My next question is, how have you been able to create a unique advice offering for your clients? We'll start with you, Amy. Um. I think if anyone knows me, it would be no surprise that my unique offering was sort of the money coaching and money mindset coaching and the sort of understanding people's behaviors, their patterns, their stories that have often got them where they're at to where to why they're seeking advice. Um, they you know, we're, we're sort of all driven by our subconscious behaviors, often not even aware that that's what's going on and we can get ourselves quite stuck. So that's definitely one thing that I have in, you know, integrated into the business. Um, I did, was doing it separately, but I've actually deepened my fact-finding process. So I've had more conversations with clients um, on more of their values and goals. And I, there is a lot of fintech out there. There's a lot of soft stuff that we could, software that we could use that can help us, but I sort of tailor it to the clients as they go, as we go, um, depending on sort of listening and understanding their, their story, understanding their language. And then I, I do have a, a high touch point with my client process as well. The onboarding process is um, it's, it's several months, but it's also to get things right with them and them to be really comfortable and establish this relationship. Um, and then it's, I don't, you know, I don't like just to sit and forget, let's meet once a year. I, you know, everyone meets me twice a year. I understand people get really busy, but if they're too busy, it's, a, I get on the phone. I just text them. I call them. Like we constantly are communicating via email and whatnot. So I know there's a lot of advisors are doing that, by the way, I think it's a, you know, it's a personable thing. And I think what I, what set me apart, I guess, is really my drive to ensure that we're all on the same page and I get them and I'm listening. And I'm understanding their issues. Felicity? I think it's really good, Amy. Like you say, the, the days of this single touch once a year, I think, is gone. So there might be a single opt-in in in a year, but there's an ongoing relationship that happens with clients, particularly if you want to keep them and you want to have that deep relationship with them. So I think it's great that the whole profession has gone that way over the last few years. For us, though, the other thing is just our ability to fail well so you know we we try different things all the time to get better outcomes for clients and also to do things more efficiently to try and keep costs down for our clients so for us we're very process and system orientated on the back office side of things so that then we can do the really cool stuff with clients individually so that's been something we've spent a lot of time on developing so that we can have those deeper relationships but also run a really smooth back office that means that nobody gets left behind I guess but that process also means that you have to keep trying new things which means they don't always quite go to plan but it's how you fail fail well and then change things and adapt really quickly so that's probably the thing that we do more than anybody else is fail quicker faster and learn from it. So I find this really fascinating. Can you give me an example of failing and then adapting, changing, tweaking things to make it better for the next client or, the, or for the same client? Yep, it happens all the time. So we, we know what our flywheel is, so what our um, kind of the things that drive our business. And we choose one of those things every quarter to work on. So, for example, during our meeting process, our review process, it was taking us too long to do review meeting, review notes. So we build an automated system for that that then also sends clients copies of that, like a version of that. Um, the first time we did a webinar, we thought webinars will be great. They'll help us build a business, which is fantastic until 45 minutes into it, you realize you didn't turn the sound on. 
and you've wondered for the last 40 minutes why everybody is just dropping off one by one and it's not till somebody in the office actually you know slips a note under your door that says you know you, you don't even have any sound a lot of people would go I can't do webinars we tried that that was terrible I think the first webinar after that we had two people on it or something it was terrible but it's just that consistency compounds so you you figure out why it didn't work try it again refine it a little bit do the next one it's a little bit better find what didn't work find what did work double down on that and just over and over and over and over and over again I, I could give you so that. many failures, I, it's I, not funny. I failed terribly in my first couple of webinars and I do webinars all the time. And sometimes people just don't show up. And I also got a question, my my messaging, my marketing, how come no one's showed up? Um, and then there's times where I've realized, oh, I've only sent it out in one newsletter. Of course, no one's going to show up. You've got to keep persist, like being repetitive as well. Everyone's busy. So I've also had that same incident of not having the sound on. So I, I, I'm with you on that and having, you know, again, no one show up or having a group there, but um, just having lots of tech issues and having to change platforms right there in your live situation and send an email out and start again. All those things, crazy, but you've got to do it. You're right. You've got to be persistent and not give up. You're right. And I remember my first ever podcast, I forgot to press record. So we're talking for 10 minutes and then, you know, I realized, oh, we're not recording, guys. We have to start again. <laughs> Now, um, Amy, in a very uh, or vastly male-dominated industry, why are female planners such a powerful force? And I'm saying this by experience. Um, a lot of the best financial planners I know are female. I think it comes down to the way we communicate. It's a little different. Where um, It's a tough one because I don't want to dismiss our, my male colleagues and I've got some great, great advice a male advisor friends and um, and many that have really been incredibly encouraging. I think in terms of how we operate in advice and where it really does come down to how we communicate, how we feel we're, we're it's not so transactional. It is again more about the relationship, listening, tapping into what's important and really digging that information out and sort of and then building on that. Um, that has been my experience anyway. And speaking with other other female advisors, um, we're all sort of very similar in that respect. It's it's more that relationship, and we're great with what we do. The, the, the strategy is one part of the bigger picture. And I think um, also women want to seek more, like talk to another woman. I've spoken like I, my businesses. Most of them, most of my clients are female. The, the I do have male clients. The male clients are usually part of the couple. Um, but I get a lot of females that have come out of divorces uh, or, they're, you know, I've got some younger women coming through now. And um, the experience I've had is when the, with the divorcees is, is that it's so nice to actually have a conversation with someone who's understanding my fears and what's, what's scaring me and actually saying it's absolutely normal, it's okay. And also hearing this, the other side of things is, wow, you're actually look, listening to me, you know, whereas I've seen an advisor before and, I felt like I didn't exist when they were in their partner, you know, in a partnership. So, um, and I don't like hearing that. Um, and I don't think that's happening as often, but I know that women relate to each other differently to how uh, men and women relate. I don't think that makes us a better in terms of strategy, by the way, I really want to make that clear. I think from a in a tech skill kind of environment, I think we're all probably, you know, up to scratch, we're all studying, or if we have, you know, if we're not studying, we've had studied and um, we've all had to do our face here. We've all, you know, we're all at that level, right? It's now just about how we're managing and, and dealing with the, the relationship in the, in the cold face and looking after our clients. Felicity? Well, like I said, I, I entered finance in stockbroking. So very male dominated industry to the point where I was sent home for wearing a pantsuit. So, because where I worked, you know, women only wore skirts. So it's always been interesting, but it's also um, interesting that so st statistically women actually make better investment decisions as well. So fund management that's done by females. And if you actually Google, like, are women better at investing than men? 
if you tried to find one where it says the opposite, you can't. You actually can't find one. It's on page 17 of Google. Like if you're trying to find studies that support the opposite view. But part of that is patience. So women tend to turn over investments less often. Um, they stick to strategy a little bit more than men. But the other interesting thing is women even seek advice for different reasons. So when I was back at Macquarie, we did a research study into why females seek advice compared to why men do. And men are wired to be hunters gatherers. So, you know, it's, it's something that I'm doing. I'm trying to accumulate wealth. I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to provide for family. Women actually usually seek advice because of fear. So it's usually because of a specific event. So I am having children. I need to sort out my money. I want to buy a house. I need to sort out money. I might be made redundant. I need to get advice. We're going to retire. So we're typically very much more a specific event has led us to get advice, whereas men will more often seek advice just in the accumulation of wealth and to know that they're doing the right thing. So I think the understanding of the difference is also important. Mm -hmm. Not to say that they're all like that, but that is it's statistically correct, I guess. Yeah, I, I was actually in a meeting yesterday with um, uh, Andrew, I think it's Andrew Pond from um, NetWealth because they're doing uh, work with core data on this topic about why women seek advice. I know that wasn't your question, uh, Ash, in terms of what makes women female advisors great but I think it does come down to the fact that we can recognize that women do have these drivers that are very different to men and and I agree that's sort of why I sort of said I that when client comes in I can see their fear or women often are there because they're worried about everybody else they want to make sure the family's okay they want to protect everybody. They want to make sure that they've got a legacy. They look, everyone's going to look, be looked after. So, that, you know, women's uh, attitudes are very different to men's in that respect. And I completely agree with um, what Felicity said. There's a lot of data out there um, and there's going to be more because I know that there's being worked on at the moment on what why what drives women to seek advice and what actually prevents why, why women, there, there are not enough women seeking advice and what's stopping them. It's the same with women giving advice, though. So I think both males and females make good advisors. I just think females are still underrepresented. But that's in all things financial. There is still a gender gap when it comes to finance. <clears throat> Absolutely. I think it's only 20% of us females in the um, advice space. So 20% representing their 16,000 advisors. I mean, I'd love to see that number increase. And I think that if we've got more women, I believe more women would seek advice because there's also that connection women have they communicate differently they're not so intimidated by another woman talking about their finances than maybe a guy in a suit very well said and it ties really well in the next question how do you intend to use your new role as award winners to elevate others in financial planning especially women how do we attract more female financial advisors well, I think whether it's male or female, it's it's the industry has clearly been through a challenge in the last couple of years. So I think the thing that the award does is give you a platform to show what advice, what effect advice has on people, the joys of the profession rather than just the rules and regulations and compliance and questions that have been around the profession over the last couple of years. So it's really, I think, to give it more visibility and to provide a platform for that message for me anyway. So, um, you know, my, I don't think my career is going to change any because I won an award. It's just part of a journey for me, I'm sure. Well, I'm really looking forward to doing more mentoring with other advisors and again, being able to share that platform. But um, for me, like I say, the award is just part of a journey that somewhere along the way just said, you, you look like you're doing a good job at the moment. Sure, but you can also recognize that, you know, there's probably someone uh, at the AFA gala dinner that sees you and says, I want to be her in five years, 10 years, 20 years, right? Yeah. I was well, hopefully they can learn by some of my mistakes and not make all the ones that I made. <laughs> but the, uh, the same thing, I remember I was like that. Mm. You know, I, I wanted to be one of those advisors. 
Um, and the only way you're ever going to do it is by giving it a shot, doing it, doing your best and then giving it a go. Yeah, Maybe. absolutely. Um, look, I'm going to be quite bold in saying I have an agenda with this um, platform because I'm working with a charity and I'm very involved in AFA Inspire. I want to see more women come into the to the industry. Um, so I want to play my part in in that area, but also I want to see the limelight sort of the the light shone on the issues of um, financial literacy and helping more women actually take control of their finances. So I've launched a course and um, I'm also part of that course when people purchase goes to the charity, which is the equanimity group. Um, and so I, I am, you know, I do have an agenda. I feel that this is an opportunity to um, make some noise, so to speak, and get people to think about their, 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 their finances, their lives, and actually make a change, a positive change for the best. But looking at it, as, as Felicity said, it's um, we've been stuck in a place for such a long time in our industry where we're focused on the negative and now let's look at all the good things that we can do and actually how the outcomes of financial advice can really make a positive impact on everyone's lives it has a rippling effect so it's it's really now about you know making noise about that amazing and very open-ended question to to finish the podcast so i know winning an award is definitely not the end of the journey it's actually a new beginning right so what is next for amy and felicity we'll start with you felicity uh so being the owner of our own practice for me it's it's staying the course of what we've always been trying to do which is make a sustainable business that's sustainable for staff so that we all have life balance, sustainable for clients, um, so that they're always getting value and have a good financial planning journey, I guess, and sustainable for the business itself, because there's no point giving advice if nobody actually makes any money out of it, and then you won't be around to give advice anymore. So for us, it's, it's we've got a long-term plan, and that is so we still want to double the size of the business here. So we'll just keep on the course of consistency and an improvement. Amy? Excellent. Um, I'm similar. I've got the business that I've got to focus on and I want to grow the business. Um, however, I also, as I mentioned, my agenda is to sort of work on getting my getting courses out there and increasing financial literacy. Um, I've been sort of already been invited to do speaking gigs and things like that. So I love my podcast. I've got the podcast and I love to do all of, you know, those, those kind of creative side of things as well and educate people. I'm a bit of a chatterbox, but I'm, I'm very passionate about um, the mindset and, and finance. So marrying those two concepts up is sort of where I want to keep going and growing in the business. So having the sensibility arm with the podcasts and the education program, and then working with the community as well as growing the business. But I see it as one big process. So um, similar to you, Felicity, growing. It's, it's pretty much about growing. It's, it's where to from here. It's just keep growing. Amazing. Thank you so much for being part of the AFA Gen X podcast, being one of the best podcasts I've ever recorded. And I look forward to seeing you grow over time. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks, Ash. We hope that you've enjoyed episode 14 of the AFA Gen X podcast. Thanks again to the AFA and Advice Intelligence. A massive shout out to Felicity and Amy for sharing their stories with the AFA community. See you soon.